Thank you, Mr. Chair. I represent the Massachusetts 7th, and uh, Boston uh, makes up the bulk of my district, and out of the 100 largest cities uh, in the country, it is ninth in being hardest to count. It's a vibrant, diverse, dynamic district, but one of the most unequal in the country, and that is certainly uh, true when it comes to health outcomes. Uh, and so census data is used to allocate hundreds of billions of dollars in federal funding for health care programs. Uh, most people are unaware that that includes Medicaid and CHIP, the Children's Health Insurance Program. These programs provide coverage to millions of families working to make ends meet in the United States. Ms. Gupta, can you explain how census data determines federal spending for Medicaid and CHIP? Well, census data is um, the basis by which these really large federal programs are going to be able to allocate dollars per person um, in, in districts. And so literally an undercount of people in your community will result in uh, smaller block grants being given um, through these programs for kids uh, to get the health care that they need. And of course, we know also about health care disparities already. So the consequences of an undercount in communities, um, the health care consequences are going to be that much more dire. And could you just elaborate a little bit more on that, Ms. Gupta? How would failing uh, to count hard to reach communities in the 2020 census further entrench already uh, existing systemic barriers? Well, there's been, there have been, there's a wealth of information showing the degree to which healthcare disparities hit low income communities, communities of color at a highly disproportionate rate. Uh, when you think about, if you're thinking about structural issues like the allocation of federal dollars to support programs that are specifically targeted to address those gaps and close the chasm, um, uh, if there is an undercount of those very communities, it becomes a vicious cycle, an undercount of those very communities, uh, the, the dollars that are allocated for the programs intended to reach them are then also diminished and reduced. And Thank so it becomes a structural vicious cycle. Thank you. And Mr. Vargas, what does this mean for Latinx communities which are already uninsured at disproportionately higher rates? The irony is that when a community suffers an undercount, the services that are based on census data then are even delivered uh, less so to those same communities. So take the, uh, the example of very young Latino children. They are the most frequently undercounted population in the country. 400,000 very young Latino children ages zero to four were not counted in the 2010 census. So all of the data, all of the programs that are designed to benefit very young children are off because the numbers are wrong. Thank and you. if your numbers are wrong, your decisions and your funding allocations are wrong. Thank you, Mr. Vargas. And, and Mr. Morial, um, is it your opinion that this could disproportionately worsen health outcomes uh, in the black community on, on issues like maternal mortality or, or other health disparities? For all across the board, every single health disparity would be exacerbated by an undercount because the list and the range of programs that rely on census data for the allocation of funds is long and deep. I think it's approximately $800 billion in the, federal gov in the federal budget is allocated based on the data collected in the census. So it, it stands to reason, whether it's Medicaid, Medicare, uh, Children's Health Insurance Program, CBDG, uh, Head Start, uh, you could go down the line. It's so essential, we've got to communicate that uh, to our communities, but that's why we've got to hold census accountable to do the right thing and make sure everyone is counted because the impact is political when it comes to reapportionment of every single office in the country that it, for whom the people are elected by districts. The impact is economic because it affects 800 billion. The impact also goes beyond that because as a questioner, uh, one of the members asked earlier, the entire framework for market-based data used by the private sector, by the media uh, companies is based on census data. Our own State of Black America report is Thank based you. entirely on census, in large part on census data. Thank you, uh, Mr. Morial. And with my remaining time, just um, um, yes or no, if any of you uh, have thoughts uh, in 20 seconds as to whether or not incarcerated men and women should be counted and included in the census according to the home communities they're from and not where they are being mostly uh, warehoused. Yes, yes, and yes. And let me just say this. We 
had the Census Bureau on the brink of reversing this just before the 2016 election. The 2016 election impacted this. So the Census Bureau was on the verge because we had advocated for many, many years that they change where those who are incarcerated are counted to their home districts. And it changed. So the election impacted this. It is not fair, it is not appropriate to allow those counties where that happen to house correctional facilities to get a disproportionate share of resources as well as political power because they just happen to be the place where incarcerated people are. This is, an, and I urge, Congressman Clay's got a bill yeah. that would reverse this. Well, he's not here, but his seat is there. Uh, and I think we need to make a priority to push that bill through the Congress so that this is not the case in the 2030 census. Thank you. I was just gonna say amen. Thank you.